We are not a program that's afraid of big words, but this is much bigger than most. It's potentially an epoch, the Anthropocene, or Anthropocene. More on that in a second. It is the fascinating subject at the core of a new exhibit mounted simultaneously at the National Gallery of Canada and the Art Gallery of Ontario, and it's called Anthropocene, or Anthropocene, the Human Epoch, and here to help us understand it all much better, photographer Edward Bertinsky, filmmaker Jennifer Beshwal, and Director of Photography of the Project, Nicholas Dupontier, and I am delighted to welcome all three of you here today for, I mean, this thing is extraordinary. It's absolutely gorgeous, and I can't wait to get into it, but first things first, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> well, it's a subject of a lot of internal debate, and Ed and Nick are on the Anthropocene side, and I'm on the Anthropocene side, which loosely translates as sort of an American way of saying it and a European way of saying it. You go for the European way. Okay, well, we'll use both here just so we can keep everybody on happy terms. Okay. Just let's start with a little bit of background, shall we? Mr. Director, would you like to roll this clip, please? Thank you. Humans go from being participants in the whole Earth to being a dominant feature. Dominating the oceans, the landscape, the agriculture, animals. It could be a full-scale catastrophic change. a way to get back. We live now in a different world. It is such a fundamental change in the way the Earth is behaving that we need to communicate that as powerfully as possible to everybody. Huh, that's from the film? That's from the film. Mm -hmm. How much footage do you, how long is the film? The film is 90 minutes. How, how much footage did you shoot to get 90 minutes of finished product? Around 300 hours. And I know that sounds incredibly inefficient, <laughs> but it's a, actually a philosophical approach to making documentary that is about gathering and not dictating um, about what you're trying to get people to do. You just go into the field, into the context, and, and let it happen. Did you shoot all 300 hours? No. Because <laughs> no. you would not be here today if you did. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. We, none of us could have individually done, uh, done this project. It was a necessary collaboration among us three and all of our teams, and even then we were, we were stretched. It's so big in scale. How many years altogether to put it together? Four plus. Four plus. Here's the word, whether it's Anthropocene or Anthropocene. Here's the handy-dandy definition. The proposed current geological epoch in which humans are the primary cause of permanent planetary change. Jennifer, when was the term Anthropocene first suggested? So Paul Crutzen, who is a Nobel Prize winning scientist, uh, first coined the term in the early 90s, right? About 12 years ago. Yeah, about 12 years ago. And uh, he said, we are now in, in, in an epoch, a geological epoch, where um, humans have shifted the planet systems outside their natural limits, outside their natural boundaries. And we should be, we were ostensibly in the Holocene Epoch, which is the geological epoch since the last ice age receded. Mm -hmm. And the, there are a group of scientists and geologists who are arguing that because of research, and they've done 10 years of research on this, we now know that humans change the earth more than all natural processes combined. When do you think it started, the Anthropocene epoch? Well, it's, it really, I mean, when we started to move to cities and build cities, I think that's really where the technological revolution began. So we stopped being hunter-gatherers. But, um, but in terms of what they're looking at, I think they're um, thinking that, it, the scientists are thinking that it's the nuclear uh, detonations that we did, the 2000, nuclear detonations that left a layer of uh, radiation around the planet that can be read from the top of Mount Everest uh, and e including in the corals. So there's a marker there that they can say anywhere on the planet there, there's a marker and 65 million years ago 
our planet was hit with a meteor and created an iridium cloud that settled over a decade or two, which took out all the dinosaurs and all the big mammals. So 70% of life was extinguished at that moment. So that is a marker, and, they can, and that left a mark around the planet where that layer is. So when they see that layer, they say, aha, that was 65 million years ago. Arguably, you know, the nuclear layer is that same kind of layer for a future geologist to find someday and say, ah, this is now the Anthropocene. This is the moment where we've had another extinction event that's close to the one that we're not sure where it's going to end, but uh, we but are now. Probably 70 plus years ago then, right? Hiroshima, Seven, Nagasaki? 19, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like around the 50s. 50s. Yeah. Around the 50s, okay. This, can we look at the jump? I don't know how we do this without putting our backs to the camera, but let's try. The picture behind us on the Jumbotron, um, what is this? This is, this is shot from Cathedral Grove, British Columbia. I think you guys, Nicholas, you guys chose this for the backdrop for the interview, right? What does mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. particularly say to you? Well, one of the things as we look at how much humans are affecting the planet uh, and, and how that is perhaps reaching a tipping point is to uh, remind ourselves, maybe a kind of a, an illumination through juxtaposition, that there still are pristine uh, landscapes, that there still are areas that have a complete biodiversity. Uh, and in Canada, we're extremely lucky uh, to have m more than most uh, of, in, in terms of our wild spaces. And that's what's really in danger of being lost. Uh, and so there, there are moments in the film where we spend time in a pristine landscape like this. Uh, we spend time in the full panoply of life of a coral reef as well to remind us what we have to lose if we don't uh, somehow rein in or control uh, a lot of our practices. Well, if that is one side of the coin, we're about to show a series of pictures that are the other side of the coin. And Edward, I'll have you take us through these. Here, this is open pit mining. We're going to show pictures of deforestation, of urban sprawl. And I have to tell you, these pictures are absolutely gorgeous. They're stunning. But of course, they are portraying incredible degradation of the planet. So in your view, are these pictures, I want to make sure I understand this, are these pictures beautiful or ugly? Well, I think they're visually compelling. I'd rather use mm -hmm. that than the word beautiful. I think they draw you in and uh, hopefully invoke a sense of wonder of where is this place? How could this be here on the planet? And that's one of the things I've always been interested in w uh, with the camera and the still frame is to allow the viewer to fall into the image and to begin to try to parse it to understand what am I looking at? Where is this place? And, and then to also uh, have some detail in there, a truck or a person standing that reveals the incredible scale. And these are equivalents to what I believe are our urban spaces, our cities. So we live in a metropolitan city, Toronto, but that, all that material comes from somewhere and we don't see that other world. Mm -hmm. So I see the work as a bridge to those worlds so that it opens us up to what's happening out there in nature, we're in the places that we go to get the things that we need. And in, in, in some of these images, that, like the first one that popped up is, a, is in Wyoming, where a lot of coal comes from the uh, United States and it's being shipped abroad and it's also being burned in uh, power stations across America. Please hit, there we go. Thank you, Sheldon. Yeah, that's the one. Coal, yeah. coal mining in Wyoming. And it's, it's uh, again, we, we got some film footage of the trains carrying the coal and, and Nick and I were there for, for three or four days. Uh, recognizing the scale of the infrastructure of, uh, of these coal mining regions uh, around Gillette and Wyoming, and uh, just train after train loaded with coal coming through one every hour, and these, the length of these trains is phenomenal. And, and you start to understand the scale of what human need is and how replacing that base load of energy is, is, is such a daunting problem to replace that with windmills or, 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 or solar panels. But so, you, know, uh, you know, obviously people can look at the same picture and come to very different interpretations. Donald Trump would look at that picture and say, that's progress. Th those are jobs for people who voted for me. You look at those pictures and see environmental degradation. Well, and, and I see that this is business as usual. This mm -hmm. is what we do every day to, to survive a, a, as a species. And, and it is troublesome because we know what's, you know, by burning coal, in particular coal is the worst of the three between natural gas and oil, coal is the worst. But 
But we know that there's a consequence to this and we're loading the atmosphere with CO2, which is now causing the oceans to warm and acidify. Uh, so these things, we know that there's a, there's a, a real problem occurring. Since you just referred to it, I'm, we've got this picture up now. This is a petrochemical plant, I gather, in the state of Texas. Okay, and Jennifer, can we see the, the other one in Nigeria, the oil bunkering in Nigeria? And then I'll get Jennifer to tell us what techno, there we go. Oil bunkering in Nigeria. What are techno fossils? I have a techno fossil with me. You do? I brought it. Um, techno fossils are human created or altered materials that persist in the biosphere and eventually end up in the strata or rock layers of the earth. That's what geologists are interested in. So, for example, they look at contemporary landfill sites as future strata, as, as these layers and layers of garbage get compressed mm -hmm. and stratified, someone in the future will look at that and say, this is all human material. This comes from uh, outside the Basque estuary in Spain, which was a, had a huge iron industry. And they used to take all of the slag and dump it in the ocean outside of the estuary. And then through the repeated action of waves on, on materials, these rocks have come up onto the beach and are now embedded in the strata. This is entirely made of iron, but it, is, it looks like a rock. So it is a hmm. human material that has become lithified. And the AWG scientists, this is one of their categories of research. Technofossils are, you know, uh, concrete, aluminum, plastic, things that we use every day that will persist. And they estimate that the technosphere which is the entire aggregate of human created or altered material on Earth, is over 30 trillion tons. Yeah. How does plastic fit into a techno fossil? Plastic is a techno fossil, and plastic is, is one of our biggest there's problems. One, there's the, one of the pictures right is, there. This is Dandora landfill site, um, where people informally work these grounds, recycling materials, selling bottles, selling materials. and. We're looking at this problem and kind of thinking about, well, the, the, the plastic bottles, single-use plastic, the mm. fact that we're still doing this now, the fact that in Ontario, we don't have a plastic bottle deposit program. Why? 90% of plastic bottles end up in, in, in landfill. Yeah. And if you do the deposit, mm -hmm. it, it immediately shifts to 90% end up being recycled and reused. Mm. It's a no-brainer. Why, why, why aren't we doing it? Mm. Here are another couple of beautiful pictures. These, Nick, from a potash mine in Russia. Can you tell us what we're looking at? Again, this looks absolutely spectacular, I guess, until you figure out what's really going on there. Well, uh, you know, the work is meant to be not accusatory, uh, and certainly to get to the world population that we have, uh, we've had to uh, up our agriculture game that has a lot of, of inputs. And so we could have gone to potash mines in, in the prairies, but mm -hmm. they're a very dull slate gray. They're not this incredible psychedelic uh, mm -hmm. pattern. Um, and so we are uh, deep underground in the Ural Mountains and our visual research, which we do for months and months, a year almost, before we, we identify the locations that we want to go and represent uh, these issues that we're trying to resonate in, in the project, turned up this incredible mine in, in, in Russia. And getting access is, is really difficult, but... Um, uh, access from government officials, you mean? But first of all, to get into Russia with a camera crew, as uh, I think everyone told us, never been more difficult since the Cold War, and it took some doing, but we did it. And then we were uh, obviously access to the industrial sites, to the mine and everything. We have to convince them that we're not doing a hatchet job. We're, we're presenting things as they are. And, and um, uh, we, were, we were hassled quite a lot by the uh, Russian police and everything there. I think they didn't quite believe that we were do, ex expending all of this uh, energy and we weren't spies or uh, you know, environmental activists, but it was an art project and everything that we said L that it was. Let me pick up on that with Ed. How it, this is underground. Yes. How do you take a picture of something that's underground, which presumably has no light there? <laughs> yeah, well, we had to bring a, a, a lot of lights with us, and thank God for LED lights these days, because we can actually run these lights with battery and stay a whole day underground. Uh, in, the cases of, uh, uh, in the case of this image, uh, I had uh, two of my assistants working with lighting, hiding it under their coats, and walking along these tunnels 
at a perfectly smooth pace so that I'm painting. So the camera's uh, lens has is, is been open to the light for maybe two minutes because it's totally dark. And then we just start the lights and walk. And I probably did about 20 versions of it before I get got the lights smooth enough. And I had to direct the two, uh, the two assistants to kind of get the pace perfect so we didn't burn it out. So it's interesting with digital as well is that if it was film, I could not see what I, you know, what I was doing as I was doing it. Whereas I got instant feedback on the back of the camera and say, oh, it's a little dark over there. And I'd bring the, you know, Mike, Mike and Jim over and say, it's more time spent here, less time spent here. So it was a, it was a kind of a fun uh, light painting uh, kind of puzzle. And do I presume, Nick, that while you're down there, you're sort of waiting for your minders to tap you on the shoulder any second and say, okay, time's up, time to get out? Our, our poor minders, because uh, we fell in love with the mine down there, but it's also logistically very challenging. It took us a long time to do what we wanted to do, so we kept saying, actually, we want to go back down again tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and I think we were seven days. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we felt, in, in the beginning, you go down there, and it's such an exotic and rarefied environment. <laughs> You're, uh, and by the end, we were like bored miners just punching the clock. <laughs> yeah. But those, those patterns come from carnalite, sylvite, and halite, which are naturally occurring minerals. That's where the reds and the, and, the deep, and the blues come from. And this is potash mining. Potash is used in fertilizer, agricultural fertilizer, as is nitrogen and phosphate. And these are huge markers of the Anthropocene because the nitrogen cycle has, we have done more to impact the nitrogen cycle as humans than in the past 2.5 billion years. We have done more in the last several decades. Yes than in 2.5 billion years because of agriculture and uh, because of, of, of using these fertilizers. Hmm. You folks shot in the most polluted city in Russia. Have I got it right? Norilsk, is that what it's called? Norilsk. Norilsk, okay. Can we bring up these next shots now, Sheldon? Okay, I, I'd like to know more. Nick, why don't you start us off here? Tell us more about the challenges of shooting in a very, very polluted place and flip the shots over, because <laughs> we ha there we go. There you, there you three are. Well, okay. What's the significance <laughs> of this shot? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when, when you there's so much expectation when you've been researching and trying to get access for so long, and you're finally there, and all you want to do is is photograph and film. Um, or sleep, which you need to do sometimes, which is difficult there because the sun never sets. And we actually determined that the best light was between about 2 and 6 a.m. So we'd have dinner and go to bed and wake up again and go out. Um, but uh, um, it's a closed city, Norilsk. Where it's, is it? It's 320 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. It's a one-company town of 200,000 people. What's the company? Uh, Nor Nickel. Nor Nickel. So they're mining nickel there? Yes. I mean, think, think Sudbury, north of the Arctic Circle, 200,000 people. Um, uh, and even if you're Russian, you need a permit to get there. It was built with gulag slave, slave labor, and uh, they're very protective, I guess, about its strategic importance, and then probably also not wanting a lot of, of light cast on the fact that there's no scrubbing. I mean, you get off the, off the plane at the airport and the we learned later the wind happened to be blowing that way, but our eyes were streaming, our lungs were burning. We looked at each other and said, I, I, I'm not even sure we're gonna do this because they're there for 10 days for filming. So to work there is in essence to, to accept that you're gonna die of cancer someday, presumably. Well, hold on. Wanna let, go that far? Uh, no, let, let, mm -hmm. let's remember that this is a city of 200,000 people, all of whom are making a living working in this industry at this mine, who live there every day, who have to live with these conditions. Mm -hmm. So for us to be able to go in there and kind of uh, it, it's illuminate what is happening there, mm -hmm. it has the biggest colored metal mine, so it's not just nickel, it's copper and palladium and they have the biggest metal smelting complex in the world. So um, we use that. I mean, our cell phones have that palladium in it. Mm -hmm. our, you know, the, the copper, the nickel, we're, we all partake of these environments. And par part of our, the reason that we go to such lengths and so far is to connect all of us, us and everyone, to places that we are responsible for, but would never mm. normally see. And thanks to you, we see them. Well, and so, and so when we go there for 10 days, we count ourselves lucky that we don't live there all the time. But at the same time, there is this human element to the people working there who are mm. feeding their families, they have jobs. It, it, it's a necessity. So there's a complexity 
to these places as well that I think is very important for us to highlight. We're not just saying this is a terrible place, um, despite the fact that we were detained and fingerprinted and, and all of that. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a place where people are, are, are living. Margaret Atwood has some connection to this project. What is it? <laughs> Well, we made a film uh, called Payback about Margaret Atwood's Massey lectures uh, a number of years ago, and she is an old friend. And is that um, the one about debt? That's one Colin about Red debt. Black was in it. Yeah, I remember yeah. that one well. That was good. Uh, but she is. Uh, we asked her if she wanted to contribute to the book. So this is not only a museum exhibition; it is a feature documentary film, and it's a book uh, that has essays in it. And she contributed to our book by writing a suite of poems, which were. Uh, uh, originally going to be called the Plasticine Suite. So <laughs> instead of the Anthropocene, she thinks that we're sort of in the Plasticine because of plastics. Gotcha. Can we do, Sheldon, uh, picks 18 and 12, that's the beautiful view of planet Earth from the moon, which had a huge impact on the environmental movement. It's almost, my goodness, it's almost 50 years since uh, Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. Those pictures had an incredible impact on the conversation going forward. What kind of impact do you hope you can have with the pictures that you are now introducing to the world? Well, when you look at that picture of the Earth, I think it, what it said to us as humans on the planet that we live in a closed system, that, that all of a sudden we can see the whole planet as a ball at, from outer space. And, and, and that view was just never seen before. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to like James Lovelock Gaia theory in that it's all connected, the water, the earth, the, you know, the forests, the fields, the savannas, all of it, the life on earth is all interconnected. And I think through, you know, what we're hoping to do is that when people experience the film, they recognize that you know, we as humans are now the architects of the future of this planet. We, it's in our control. We're the managers. It's a question of can we get together internationally to, to, to get on top of these problems before they run away with, with us and, and we start seeing positive feedback loops like the methane starting to melt in the permafrost of the north. If that starts to go, we have nothing in our toolkit that can actually slow that down. Or if we lose all the you know, white from the snow cap, from, from the Arctic and all the snow, it's that, all that water begins to absorb the heat, you get these positive feedback loops. So it's worrisome that if these things start to kick in, you know, wh what are our options at that point? Or do we have any options at that point? So we're still at this very, very critical moment where there's still hope that we can actually get ahead of the worst of the problem, the problems that may come. But, but it, it, you know, I, I worry that we're just not acting uh, uh, with enough urgency uh, to, to get ahead of these problems. And then we leave that to the next generations to fight. Uh, in our last minute here, I wonder, Nick, whether this is a continuing collaboration. You've started something and you want to do more. Or have you two really, or you three rather, had enough of each other at this point? We are really <laughs> excited uh, that right now all of these years of work are coming to fruition and, and that the uh, museum shows um, are going to be able to be seen by the public and the film. So uh, we're too much in the middle of that, I think, to look forward and in a way this is a culmination of all of our collaborations together and 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 a lot of work that we've done in our careers and we identified that early that this this may end up by being our our big statement and um, uh, I'm happy about that Th this work is an act of hope uh, an act of hope so Jennifer is. you don't think people will emerge from having seen all this thinking we're screwed we're, we've passed the point of no return. No, no um, hopefully not. And it is because I think we have this opportunity. We, we have thrived as a species. We have. We have the ingenuity and the tenacity to thrive. So we also have the ingenuity and tenacity to, uh, as Ed says, consider the Earth as a whole system and know that we are the managers and we have to pull these systems back to a safe place for all life on Earth. And I believe we can do it. The, be the shift in consciousness is the beginning of change, really. Mm. Once we know what we're doing um, went collectively, uh, then we have to have the collective will to change. And we hope, that's why we do it. We, we do this work in the hope that it will have an impact to, to, towards positive change. Well, we thank you for doing it and for coming into TVO tonight to talk about it. Ed Bertensky, the photographer, 
Jennifer Bechwal, the filmmaker, Nicolas de Poncier, the director of photography, Anthropocene, or Anthropocene, depending if you like European or American pronunciation. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Great Thank to meet you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.